We take the uh, Will we just jump straight into it? Uh, do you want to give us a... Are you ready to go, Jack? I forgot. I'm sake. ready to go. Okay, okay. You're not ready to go. I'm born ready. You're never you ready to go. Son of a gun. <laughs> Ever ready. Okay. You're like born ready. That's good. Okay. Good. Let's go. Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to... And that's why we're not together. Starring David Mike Savage, Hannah Andrews, and special guest Patsy Bagari. You were supposed to go religious affairs correspondent for the Irish Times. Former. Yeah, but everybody knows. I'm retired. It's <laughs> attached. Oh, is it, I, you, I, can, I, you can go ahead with it. Don't worry about it. It's not an issue. No, no. I thought. I thought you. St- oh, yeah. So you. Yeah. Well, what? What does that? What does that? Anyway. Since May um, of last year, I effectively retired. I'm on a freelance religion with a paper by choice, by personal choice. I should, I should be doing nothing. How do you feel uh, about that? About in terms of, in terms of does is retirement not a scary word? I absolutely have no intention of ever retiring. Oh, good. And so that's one of the reasons why I kept on this relationship with the paper. But I'm doing other things as well, including mm. this festival in Belhadrine, which we were talking about. Later. Which we were talking about. Yeah. Is is Patsy's microphone close enough, sir? Yeah, maybe just bring it. Just I tend to be close. But, uh, my voice tends to dip. Sorry, guys. Yeah. No. Can you just uh, make sure that you're? Thank you, yes. Patsy. Okay. Sorry, I, I project. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, Patsy. Yeah. Well, yeah. just to give some context. Yes, you have been um, religious working affairs correspondent for, since 1997 for 26 with, years with the Irish Times. With the Irish Times. Yeah. yeah. That's um, that's um, that is uh, incredible, and one of the really good uh, contributors to the Irish Times. There's a lot of other stuff that, well, you know, makes me m- makes my toes curl. Mm. I like the I can't remember the 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 uh, there was another guy as well, a uh, political commentator. What was his name? Fintan O'Toole. Fintan O'Toole. I liked Fintan. I thought Fintan. Sorry, no. No, your grand Fintan retired last the week before last. But Did he's he? Going to continue his column. I it's remember an age thing. I remember uh, in generation t- A thing. Generation mm-hmm. generation. Mm-hmm. generation dead yeah. um, I remember talking to Fintan O'Toole and Jesus Christ he was so this is sorry the reason I know Patsy McGarry is because I did a, a TV show called The Savage Eye and really? to, to, to add weight and depth and strength to the sketches and give them a reason to exist we interviewed people who were experts in their field you're an expert in your field which is good as, as a country man to think of yourself in a field being an expert. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. OK. But Fintan O'Toole was one of these uh, experts that I interviewed. And I <clears throat> no different to yourself. I was just amazed by how articulate he was and how uh, the subject he knew. So everything he seemed to know. And then I thought, why don't people like Fintan O'Toole run for election or something? But it's a very different thing. He decided at one stage about two, four or five elections ago himself and Eamon Dunphy were going to stand for election. Yeah. But they then decided against it. I think wisely. Oh, I agree. Totally. Because it, there's a, there's, you can be very intelligent, but that's not what being a TD requires. You have to be thick as well, but have s- some kind of animal sort of a, a, an instinct it's, or something. And you have to be a good networker. Or, it's a totally different thing. Yeah. Going out there and glad handing people and charming people for their votes and hoping that when they say they'll vote for you, that they will because they won't necessarily follow yeah. through. Instead of operating, if you like, in a quasi ivory tower. Yes. Where there really are no consequences of what your opinions are. You won't suffer. You won't lose your job mm. if you say something that's unpopular. Yes. Uh, or you challenge uh, mainstream thinking. Uh, as somebody ha- like Fenton has been doing most of his career and very, very successfully. Indeed, he likes to joke that he never had an unpublished thought. Um, <laughs> but he's an opinion columnist. That's yeah. his job is to challenge the consensus. Yeah. And he's so there's no way there's no way he would uh, get. A, well, he 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 would be uh, sorry. What's the word? He would be um, suitable for for office. He for might well be. But it's a very difficult transition for a journalist to make into to go into politics, for instance, like Geraldine Kennedy, the former editor of the Irish Times, did. That. And and what about that chap from RTE who got George Lee, George example. Lee, who, yeah. who 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 very quickly realised that it wasn't for him, and and realised that he wasn't going to get a, a front bench spokesmanship. I mean, Finnegan was in opposition at the time, and I think yeah. he was disillusioned by the fact that there were other people there longer than he was, and probably as qualified, if not more so, than he was, and were getting preferment over he him, and he decided to stand back from politics, went through the quasi quarantine period before he could. <laughs> going back into journalism again, as Geraldine Kennedy had to do 
uh, in 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 an our place in the Irish Geraldine Times. Kennedy, yeah. Oh, she yes, went on yes, to become yes. editor eventually of the Irish Times. She had been a political journalist. It's a difficult transition. You're talking about two very very different roles in life. Mm. Being a politician is an extraordinarily difficult, challenging job. My father was one. Your father was mm. one. My father was one at a local level. Um, and you sound like a politician now, Patsy. I've resisted that all my life. <laughs> I learned from my father's experience but, never but, to go out but, there. But, but but it is interesting. You think Christ. Um, you know, there are certain people that if they were in a leadership role, but but uh, I guess we get the leaders that we deserve. Is that a terrible thing to say? Because now who our leader is, is what's that young kid? He's 35. And he's 38 and he's not yet our Taoiseach. Uh, you're talking about Simon Harris. Simon yeah. Harris. Next week. Yeah. And, and then you think, well, this is what does it say about us that this is? But maybe it's good because he's, he's kind of a quite a bland figure and you don't want anybody to rock the boat and he's kind of uh, he has a civil service energy about him and his predecessor was 45 the man who stood down I wouldn't go against him uh, Simon Coveney is 51 I mean they're very young people mm. to be leaving a, a, a career uh, I mean the, Coveney has been 13 years in government Radker was 13 years in government hugely experienced guys I would say very impressive people as politicians and they've decided to leave the stage it's a very tough difficult life particularly in these times which uh, with social media which previous generations did not have to cope with. Oh, do you think that's part of the reason that uh, Leo Varad... They all talk like that now, anyway. <laughs> I, I don't know. Have you noticed that they all talk like fucking that? I don't know. Anyway, Leo Varadkar, what reason do we know that he's... Do you think it's because of social media pressure catching him... Was there something about him kissing some bloke or something? I don't think that incident or whatever yeah. was the factor, but I think it was cumulative. He has said how he can't go out for a meal without somebody pointing a camera at him. Oh, for fuck's sake. Sitting in a restaurant without somebody pointing a camera. I love that. Somebody, <laughs> <laughs> he has no uh, no privacy, but he didn't say that. He didn't really, he just uh, was burnt out. It, it seems from what people who observed him much more closely than I did, political colleagues, uh, uh, colleagues in the political area of journalism, uh, the guy w has never had the same appetite this time around as Taoiseach as he had when he was Taoiseach previously. Uh, it clearly, he's going through the same motions again. Even apparently, he's visited the United States this year. He was less enthusiastic about meeting the President of the United States on St. Patrick's it sounds, Day. It sounds like he was less enthusiastic than... I mean, what, what Patsy? That doesn't sound like... Hannah, what ha, do you think? Yeah, because it's like, it's like the pinnacle, isn't it? And uh, to, be, to be less enthusiastic is... is it's shocking. such an honour, I, I would imagine, to yeah. represent your country. Totally agree with you. But I think it's dangerous for a young young people to achieve so much so young. OK. I think if he had a harder road there, he'd appreciate the position more. Yeah, I, go, I yeah. agree with that. And, and another thing is, like, uh, I feel like no one, re you know, it's like, who, when was he elected? You know, I'm trying to think back the timeline, but there were so many, like, coalition governments and, and all this kind of thing where you kind of think back, like, was he elected or was it just kind of, you know... You he was know, elected about 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like he was elected so long ago. Yeah. And, and he was in his early 20s at the time. Right, right. Ah, yeah. uh, stop. In his like, early 20s yeah. elected. Wow. Would you ever F the <laughs> F, F, Fianna Fáil? I can't believe... Fianna Fáil. Fianna Fáil. I know. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's way too young. Who, what, who, why would you want to vote for somebody who wants to be a politician at that age? Would and, you go away? And then he... And he's a, so desperate to look older as well, which is weird. I mean, a, a really fast-tracked career mm. into government and yeah. into leading his party and into becoming Taoiseach of the country. And what's left? It's like, you know, they said about Alexander the Great when he conquered the known world, <laughs> laid down and died. What's left? Yeah, type of yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. 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 You feel like people. that, don't you? Not Patrick? at all. I have a bit to go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't get it as easy as that. I didn't have it handed, anything handed to me on a plate. Well, I had it really I, tough. I, I, I have to say, uh, anybody watching this, you, we're, I mean, we are so lucky to have Patsy here. And oh, he has such, oh, stop it. Patsy McGuire. And, and he, he, he has such a wealth of life experience, a wealth of knowledge about. What's coming? Well, well, you know, because definitely younger people. They didn't grow up in that atmosphere where uh, the clergy and as Joe Duffy, the religious, as Joe Duffy would say, the religious uh, were revered and they were really um, the, that awful phrase pillars of the community, but sort of the shamans, the wise people that they were just held, held, held in uh, this uh, it's, it, as in Poland as well, they were held in such high oh, yeah, esteem yeah. and respect, and so on. And yeah, now yeah, they even in, even in the communist Poland, they always were worship almost. And they, they, uh, people were very deferential. And if you saw a priest, you know, no matter who you were, 
as Father No Volume. Yeah. It's very rare to see a priest around the, the place nowadays. Well, the average age is 71, 72. They're dying out, literally. Uh, they retire at 75. The average age for a priest in a religious congregation is about 75. Mm. They are, I mean, in, when you were young or when I was young, they were everywhere. Uh, in 1961, there were so many priests in Ireland that they had had to, forgive the word, export between a third and a half of them to the missions. <laughs> That's true. They had to go abroad because there was nothing for them to do here. Uh, um, so th- th- that was the height of it, was it? Or, or, numbers uh, wise. Numbers wise. At, at the same time, and I always think this is fascinating. In 1961, the population of this republic was at its very lowest. It went down to 2.8 million people, about as many people who are actually working here today. And meanwhile, the church was flourishing to such a degree that they had they had to send between a third and a half of their priests abroad to work in Africa mainly, or in the United States, Canada, or the English speaking world generally speaking. What was the what was the reason that that was seen as such a you know would you call it career uh, or an appealing career? Was it to do with the fact that um, that people didn't have much choice? Is that is that it? Career wise, and it, and it, it seemed like a. It's not dissimilar to what happened in Poland. I mean, the church was identified as opposed to the regime of the day, as mm-hmm. representing the nationality or the identity of the real Irish people, the real Polish people. Uh, except we were a bit bit ahead of yourselves historically, and I mean, towards after Catholic emancipation in eighteen twenty nine. Um, the Catholic Church began in Ireland to get off its feet. Excuse me, sorry, Patsy, you just throw that around like we know what. Do you know what Catholic emancipation well, is? Because this you is were, interesting. You, were, you love you your history. You weren't, uh, Catholics weren't allowed to uh, worship their their religion freely and stuff like that. Good so, man, Jack. So some, something along the lines yeah. of that. Okay, I didn't in know. Ireland? I for- yeah. In Ireland? Up to 1829, it had relaxed, but the penal yeah. laws were a very severe uh, set of laws to diminish Catholics. They weren't allowed to own property over a certain value, five pounds. They weren't allowed to own a horse over a certain value. They weren't allowed to become members of the profession. They weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to be educated. What was the schools? The the bush schools? Hedge, hedge schools. Hedge schools. Hedge schools. And they were you, they hiding the bush. You're thinking about you're thinking about marijuana. You little fucker. <laughs> yeah, bush. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah they're all lovely joints. <laughs> they, hedge schools. Yes. Hedge so, schools so, so, were, so. Where were called spoiled priests, men who went for the priesthood, didn't finish, and had Latin and Greek, and was to teach people. Like you, it features in some. Brian Fields, Fields plays like translations. There's a hedge school master there. Um, so that was those the Irish Catholics up to and uh, to the night, 1700s they began to relax. Uh, Daniel O'Connell led a campaign one of the great Irish politicians of our history, entire history, um, for uh, one of the first mass movements in Europe to get Catholic emancipation. And after a long, hard haul and deep resistance in England, and to, I have to be fair about this, this was a reflection of the wars of religion throughout Europe. In other words, Protestants were treated as badly by Catholic administrations abroad. Like in France, the uh, Protestants were slaughtered. I mean, the Huguenots came to Ireland, to Dublin, to escape being slaughtered in Paris. And Dublin was a very Protestant city at the time, ah. back in the later 1700s. So that's why the Huguenots, uh, that's, that, and there would be uh, descendants of the Huguenots in Dublin still. Yeah. And there's Huguenot cemeteries around the place. On Marion Row. On Marion Row, just beside the Shelburne. Oh no! A little bit further on, up towards Donny and Esbeth, around there. Yes, that's yeah. right. There's a little, 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 little that that yeah. whole that yeah. whole area. I mean, I was working in the United Arts Club, but that whole whole area has a lot of history of like people coming over yeah. from different countries yeah. and like like Robespierre. Who's that fellow? Rob, Robespierre. Yeah, those those French Revolution. Yeah, the, yeah. the Jacobites and that's all right. that yeah. stuff. And yeah. like where I was working, in the United Arts Club was uh, Countess Markovic and the Count Markovic from Poland. Yeah. There's a picture of him coming over and yeah. all that. Yeah. Uh, He's uh, d- d- Jack is talking about the United Arts Club. I know it. Oh, William Street. Yeah, yeah. He, w- he worked there as a, a chef for okay. about a Inter- year. Interesting spot. Very, very, inter- very interesting spot. You get spot. very interesting people there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. United shite artists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shite artists. <laughs> Unlimited someday. Tight with their money. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyhow, I've, after Catholic emancipation. I've, ca- I've started, so I'll finish. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Off with you. No, no, no. They, 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 the Catholic Church began to get off its feet, uh, off its knees, in fact. Um, and then the, the famine happened. And then you had the arrival in this city of an extraordinary man. He became the first Irish cardinal, a man called Paul Cullen. He was appointed to Armagh, first of all, as Archbishop there, Primate of All Ireland. He spent most of his youth 
in Rome. And he set about rebuilding the Catholic Church and he created the church that you and I grew up in. He laid down the foundations for it. He brought in practices from the continent like uh, devotions, benedictions, Corpus Christi processions. He led this extraordinary building campaign where there were churches built throughout thousands, literally all over the island of Ireland. Uh, presbyteries built in every small town uh, around the whole island. Every diocese, and there's 26, had its own diocesan college, which is a second level education, basically to train priests. And um, by he died in 1878. And by that stage, the Catholic Church was a power here on this island. Who funded all this? The people. OK. The people. God helped them and they had enough to eat and they funded this. And that's another story. Um, they were paying for it well into the 20th century. I mean, most of these par- most parishes had huge debts, which were one of the reasons why priests were so hard on the people to get money out of them, reading off donations or contributions off mm. the altars, for instance, well and into it, the 20th century. It, it's it's ju- you, you, this is so fascinating. So, um, and I, I anyway, so you talked about the famine, and the interesting thing is that unlike a political movement, a religious movement. It, the the the, uh, the people who are starving they're they're not blaming uh, the priests or the you know the, in fact they're seeking their comfort from them so it, it almost mm. strengthens the relationship with uh, the religious orders during the famine does that am I making any sense there Jack I'm trying to well I guess what you're saying is that through the hardships and the fact that they're they had no money, but that they would be willing to give what little money they have to the priest and the church is like it's yeah, it's their salvation. It's it's what keeps them going. It, it, it was seen as the Irish people, not just the Catholic Church, getting off their knees, and that's how it was pushed. They inspired the people. Oh, do you mean how the church? Uh, do, you, we've survived dungeon, fire, and sword. We are now rebuilding ourselves again. So the churches were built at the highest spot in every small town, as was the presbytery. Higher, the, the spire would go higher than the local Protestant church. That was right, a political right. Sim- so, symbol. so, so it really tra- yeah. you look, you look at Monkstown, for instance. Not to, the Catholic church there, St Patrick's, which was built in the eighteen fifties, sixties. The spire goes above Monkstown Church. The priest who built Monkstown Church built seven in the borough area of Dublin. An extraordinary man back. They were extraordinary men. I mean, what they did do in terms of the physical achievement of all the buildings that they set up. There was a, by the end of the 1800s, there was a church or a chapel or a cathedral within three miles of every Irish Catholic. It had to be within walking distance. Yeah. And these, but these were, they were all full people were, I mean, these were. Mass music, attendance yeah. was an average 90%, which is highest in the Catholic world. And that continued into the 1970s. Fascinating. It was part of the social thing. Rather than religion, it was about a social identity, about being who you are. But anyhow, but yeah, no, but this is, but, but, but it's so interesting that it really it transcended the belief of what the central core beliefs of what Catholicism was about. It was, it was about the identity of being Irish and not being British and you know it was it was all, would would it be fair to say tribal in oh, some absolutely mm. it was it was part of the Irish identity Catholicism very mm. much so and by the end of the 19th century you had a Catholic church in Ireland which had its own schools and its own education system still it controls about 89 percent of our primary schools it had its own hospitals um, uh, it had its uh, of course sadly as we now know but at the time it was a good idea their own reformatories industrial schools and orphanages for uh, children who had been abandoned during the famine years uh, and they were brought in the nuns and priests and brothers who ran them from the continent that the brothers were native mainly uh, at the time it was a good idea yeah because they were literally at one stage in the latter part of the 19th century there was something like 77,000 children roaming the streets of Dublin and Ar- sorry Ireland mm. as a whole they were destitute there was nowhere mm. for them to go so they were brought in to care for them. Now we know what happened there mm. later. But it meant that by the t- end of the 19th century, you had a, an alternative civic state within the British state in Ireland run by the Catholic Church. OK. And, which is all and, schools and, would, and that, would that have treated Irish people better than the British state? Well, well they the treated time. Irish Catholics. Yeah. So you had in this city, you had Catholic hospitals and you had Protestant mm-hmm. hospitals. You had Catholic schools and you had Protestant s- s- schools. I mean, this city was a very Protestant city. Yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's still, I mean, you look at, Protestant. there's a, there's a load of uh, Protestant churches, oh, the yeah. Church of England churches. Yeah, and all well, that. for instance, there are only two cathedrals in this city. Yeah. And yeah. both are Church of Ireland. Yeah. 
And the Pro Cathedral is a provisional mm. cathedral. I mean, it is a Catholic cathedral. They're talking about moving it, as you know, now to Andrews, St. Andrews Church in Westland Road. I don't know. No, I don't. Where have you been sleeping? <laughs> um, Rip Van what? what, what Rip Van, uh, what, what have we uh, lost that we shouldn't have, or what have we forgotten, or what have we missed out on because of uh, all these terrible things that have happened, re- uh, that have been found out about? Yeah. I mean, what what uh, what do you think the society has? I don't think it has been a bad thing. OK, all, because to follow through on what I was saying, when this state came into being in 1922, it was very poor. It had fought a civil war. It had no money. Mm. It needed the Catholic Church to run the schools that were there. It needed the Catholic Church to run the hospitals that were there already. There were something like 13,000 priests, brothers and nuns running all those schools and hospitals at the time, 1922, when the state came into being. The state needed them. There wasn't a Department of Health in Ireland until 1947. <laughs> I mean, that's a degree to which the state depended on. And the church, the Catholic Church, for health, and of course the Protestant school, uh, sorry, hospitals and schools indeed here were also run quite separately in parallel. So the ch- this state from the beginning was fiercely dependent upon the church for basic services like education and health care. And um, it soon, as as the state came into being, they had a, quite a liberal constitution, the 1922 constitution, which allowed divorce. People don't realise or forget that. Mm. But one of the first things that happened with the after independence is that there was a move by the new Commonwealth government to get rid of the divorce provision and ban divorce. And that's when Yeats made his famous speech about we are no petty people. He was opposed to it. He was a senator at the time. But gradually, through the 1920s, You had the creation in law of a Catholic state for a Catholic people down here where you had a minority Protestant population of about 3%. And of course, in Northern Ireland, you had a Protestant state for a Protestant people. You had, if you like, the evolution of two sectarian states, which was to remain that way for most of the 20th century. Two state solution. There you are. (laughs) I mean, what the one it has evolved into is probably better. But uh, and and, I mean, people have been talking about uh, the Northern Ireland, the peace process, a model for what should happen hopefully, in Palestine and Israel as a peace process towards it. Do, we, do you see a united Ireland in your lifetime? No. Do you think uh, 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 that recent revelation about um, Jeffrey Donaldson, does that impact in any way or is it just a, an anomaly? I thought at the time it was, uh, I was utterly stunned, shocked, and I thought the implications <laughs> politically would be huge and enormous. I thought that the hardline element of the DUP who did not want to go back to Stormont would use it. I'm talking about Sammy Wilson and um, Ian Paisley Jr., who were opposed to going back to Stormont, would use it to try and undermine uh, the agreement to go back to Stormont and pull the DUP out again. But it didn't happen. I mean, they recognised the leadership of Gavin Robinson, who has been appointed by the DUP to take over from Geoffrey Donaldson. Maybe it put things into perspective a little bit. You know, uh, that, that uh, I mean, OK, we're struggling here, but it's nowhere near as uh, horrendous and potential uh, if the allegations are true. Yeah, um, I mean. So will we just say exactly what the allegations were for the for the viewers? Well, he was uh, he was uh, allegedly he sexually assaulted uh, f- 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 family members. Uh, that's the I don't know how he's, he he's up on historical abuse charges. Yeah, I don't I, that mm. word historical, uh, you know, because when people are violated in that way it takes people an awful long time to process and come to terms with what's Mm. happened to them and it takes them years to build up the courage to stand up and try to reclaim their power or autonomy so when people say historical it sounds to me like a way of ah well historic no i mean these things happened you're a hundred percent correct and having dealt with abuse survivors for many many decades Mm. There is no such thing as historic abuse. Yeah. The person who's abused lives with it every day of their lives. Yeah. Thereafter. I think in legal, legal term, the reason I'm using the word historic is that it refers to event or events in the past. Mm. But for the person who was abused, it's a lifelong sentence. Mm. Yeah. And uh, do, you, do you think, um, w- what was it about being a priest? I mean, this sounds quite like an obvious question. But, but first of all, Let's not conflate a homosexuality. In, well, we don't need to. It's this to me. This is obvious. But so, do you think a lot of uh, gay men were attracted to the religious orders? It's very hard to say. I mean, to go back to what we we're talking about. I mean, when this state came into being, uh, you had all these institutions run by brothers, priests, and nuns. Mm. And um, I mean, nobody was aware. Most people weren't aware 
that there was a sexual abuse going on. People were aware, as I was as a child, that there were pretty rough places because you'd be threatened by your father or mother. If you don't behave yourself, you're going to let her frack type of thing. But I don't, people did not know exactly what was going on there. They, 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 this degree of neglect, the degree of physical abuse. And, and let's not forget that physical abuse was everywhere in Ireland mm. at the time. It wasn't even peculiar to Ireland. Yeah. Corporal punishment was legal in most of the Western world until the early 1980s. And the Swedish, Swedish government was the first to ban it mm. in schools. And we were not too far afterwards, but it was part of life. Yes. You know, in the home. Oh, no, well, I, was, I, I was strapped with the, the leather, uh, the leather biffer, we call the biffer, we called yeah. it in Blackrock College. Of course, yeah. So you, you put out your hand yeah. and you were biffed. Well, we had canes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, excuse me. School, well, right? well, well, well. Mm. Hey, serious. The one guy. We had drills. <laughs> we, had drills. <laughs> one, one, we were slightly up, Mark. <laughs> one guy used to use uh, the electrical, uh, oh, uh, whatever. And lovely. He, he was called old sling as a result. You know, he slapped whatever the things were. But it, it but kind of, it, as a child, it made messing around that much more exciting because <laughs> the, the the danger of if you got caught was so extreme. Yeah, well, I can I tell you a story about uh, one of our Latin teachers who was a priest. Uh, he used to come into class and said, OK, boys, we're doing Caesar's, Caesar's Gallic Wars. Uh, I don't recommend them. But anyhow, he get up. OK, boy, you get up. You do translate this. He'd point to a paragraph and inevitably you'd stumble. And you get three in each hand. And then he'd say, OK, boy, who will I go to next? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That's the way he could run And the, the kid has to point it. Yeah. Now, it became a bit of a game, a bit of a whatever for, for oh, kind of among the guys. But it was, yeah. That's that's quite that's quite devious yeah. and Machiavellian, isn't yeah. it? But when you get a smack in the hand, was it was it very sore or was it just like you know just like ah he's getting smacked in the well, hand? Well, it is no, shocking. It, it's shocking. It was no smack. It's it, yeah. It <laughs> is shocking as a child four, when you're so 13, 14 when you're so years young old and yeah. this uh, person in a position of authority. Yeah. But to come back to your question, a lot of the guys who went into these running these institutions, clergy had a huge status, but mainly as much to do with political power as it had to do with spiritual power at the time, in the Ireland of the day. Uh, at a time when there were very few jobs anywhere, they were dependent upon the clergy for education. If you wanted to get a job in anything, if you wanted to go to secondary school, you, first of all, you had to pay a fee. Education wasn't free in Ireland until 1967. Uh, so these guys or whoever went into these diocesan colleges, boarding schools, or the likes of Black Rock here in Dublin or wherever, and um, if you didn't become a priest, you, got, you went to the bank or the civil service, but you needed an education to do that, so you needed to go to those schools, so you needed the clergy for that purpose. But a lot of the clergy themselves, but particularly the brothers, went into these institutions very young. I mean, the brothers went into for training at the age of 12. Christian brothers. Christian brothers. Yeah, so, so so I want I want you to keep you on this yeah. track, but yeah, that's interesting. There's all people should know. There's all these different orders. Yeah. So you'd have the Christian brothers. It's like a league of league league of priests. Mm -hmm. So you'd have the Christian brothers. You'd have the the Holy Ghost Fathers. Yeah. That's what Holy we were Ghost. called. <laughs> Holy Ghost. That's in Black Rock College, where uh, you, a lot of the priests would be living uh, on the campus, yeah. and they'd be wearing lovely little. Um, uh, what you call them sandals so you couldn't hear them coming down the corridor anyway um <laughs> but uh, you know no there was uh, the, the, the names were felt it was the, the names of some of these priests like there was a there was a priest called penis head mm. that was a nickname by the way. <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway he didn't sign it. holy ghost fathers sj society of jesus yeah. they're the jesuits, jesuits. They, they seem to be that that was a fancy enough order, wasn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Oh, OK. Yeah. Compared to the Christian brothers, would they have looked down on the Christian? Absolutely. I mean, there was a hierarchy within. OK. The religious. I so mean, give us give us some more of these then. Well, well I mean, the, the, the top would probably be the Jesuits. Right. The Holy Ghost were up there, too, as well, running the most prestigious schools for the, the middle class yeah. in Dublin or wherever uh, uh, to sustain the middle class. Um, and then you had the uh, the Christian brothers who had educated mainly working class kids and uh, who would not have had an education but for them. Similarly with the likes of the Sisters of Mercy who educated the female equivalent as well. I mean, they, they, uh, this is the other side of it. Ireland owes a huge debt to these people because they did, at a time when there was no free education at mm. well, uh, pr any level, they did supply an education for the people. Uh, and qu quite a considerable number of people did benefit. And it must be, uh, for the individuals who weren't abusers and all that um it was the majority be, we hope yeah um well it would do we anyway but it it must it must feel like um their life 
uh, ha, was wiped out or the, yeah. the, the, the good. Yeah, you see, that's the thing, though, with everybody's lumped into the yeah. ca Catholic Church. And, and w w you know, it's like doing a moral inventory. Well, we did this. Well, we did this. Well, we did this good thing. Yeah, but... But you, but you know, like, no, but hang on a second. Yeah, but you you uh, abused and uh, it's horrible mm. to say raped children. And once that happens, it's like all bets are off. It just it you can't you you can't sort of say, well, look at all the good we did. It, 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 sorry, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you know, the Ryan Commission publishes a report in uh, May of two thousand and nine after nine years mm. investigation and found one of the most shocking revelations of all that the sexual abuse was endemic mm. in boys' institutions. Yeah. I mean, there was physical abuse, there was neglect, etc., which was also the case in, in girls' institutions, orphanages and reformatories, and industrial schools for, for girls too as well. But anyhow, to come back to the original question, at 12 years of age, they went in to train to become a Christian brother. Uh, 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 most clergy, most men who went for the priesthood went in at the age of 17, 18. They had lived in both cases in all male environments until they went into for training they lived from there into all male environments while they were training. Then they were in all male environments when they became qualified. So there was no, I mean, and there was no education about sexuality at all at that time. Generally mm. speaking, never mind within these congregations. So these men, their sexual identity was assumed. Uh, if they had tendencies in other directions, there was no defined outlet for that. Uh, you could, it, and it's often been said that the reason that they resorted to abusing children, and this is not an explanation, is because they were handy. Terrible thing to say, but that's they, they were there. They were there. Yeah, and in fact, that they were, and that the, 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 uh, uh, abuse is endemic in boys' institutions involving brothers. It's because they were, it was an all male environment. And um, so, so you said there was no sex education. What was what, minimal? It was just biological. I mean, all oh, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we uh, again, and 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 I was th thankfully a day boy, a day mm. people in in my school. Uh, and it was a good school, um, but our sex education was, when you look back at now, hilarious. Mm. Uh, we would write out notes to the relevant priest. And how, what, is that to do, with, by the way, what is the squeamishness, awkwardness about humanity, about that distancing ourselves from what should be celebrated, encouraged or spoken about? What, 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 where, did, where did Catholicism... Interestingly enough, it's not a feature of Catholicism in the Mediterranean countries. They don't have the same hang up about sex. The church in Italy or in Spain, for instance, or Portugal, it's and, and, and I blame the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a joke, actually. It's true. In the latter part of the Victoria, there was a huge evangelical Christian revival in England and Wales, Britain, in the latter part, or not the latter part, in the 19th century. Very severe, particularly in Wales, very strict, severe um, um, Christianity. Um, they were the guys who brought down Charles Stuart Parnell. People blamed the Catholic Church for that, but it wasn't. It was hardline evangelicals who were among the major supporters of the Liberal Party under Gladstone at the time. Parnell, what happened? How did they bring down Parnell? For what reason? I actually don't know much about Parnell. Jesus, really. Kitty. But, but I know his his house outside of Dublin. <laughs> I've been there. Was, was it his affair with Abedale, Abedale, Kitty O'Shea? That's right. He yeah. was cited for uh, a divorce case involving an Irish MP, Captain O'Shea, who represented Galway, uh, and. Uh, Parnell was having an affair with his wife which O'Shea was aware of and there was some sort of falling out politically and O'Shea decided to sue for divorce sue Parnell for divorce it was very rare in, in the UK and at that time or certainly in Ireland and so uh, the Welsh nonconformists said we cannot support a, a government that supports okay. a man who's getting a divorce because the, uh, the uh, parliamentary party the Westminster government under, under Gladstone was supporting Parnell's fight for home rule for Ireland and so he had to go. So Gladstone withdrew his support. Then the Catholic Church, to be fair, who weren't the first to condemn Parnell, then joined in and said, no, nope, we can't have a leader of the Irish people who's uh, a potential divorcee. So, so, the, so, the, so these certain incidents um, had a, a, the accumulative effect, you think, on the national consciousness whereby... Oh, uh, well, you know, straying outside or, or, or sex, just sex, sex is danger, yeah, dangerous. Outside marriage. I mean, outside marriage. You know, but, the, even, but I'm, I'm just talking about you know the for, famous scene in the portrait of the artist of a young man. The very first. This is Christmas Joyce. Day scene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where they have this big fight. He's a child. A big fight on Christmas Day over Parnell, over this very issue where one aunt takes a very, very hard line Christian position supporting the church, supporting, etc. And uh, his father takes, uh, as it turned out, takes a very pro-Parnell position. 
But um, but at, as part of the the, the evangelical revival in England at the time, uh, there was this very severe, rigid um, Puritanism came into being, assisted by the lifestyle of Prince Albert, <laughs> who came over from your Germany. Married, who was no more married, Puritan, oh, he me was, whole. He was, he oh, was that, he was Puritan. It was that rare thing, a, 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 a loyal, um, lo- royal, pardon <laughs> A loyal royal. A loyal royal. Loyal to his wife. He was very much so. He never strayed. Oh, OK. Sorry. Uh, and that, and uh, uh, Prince who? Albert. He died. Oh, oh wh- wh- what about that thing that, you know, that, that you know. Her son, I, I, her son made, his son made up from Edward. Oh, was it? What, what's the Prince Albert? I don't want to say this terrible oh, thing. Oh, the, uh, no, the, the Prince Albert. I know, Albert what you're, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> where you put a ring in, in your. Right. in your. I have to use That's Pat Kenny voice. In your penis, you have to put a, what, a, a what, cock ring. Wasn't that something to do with Queen Victoria's husband? He, he was. Or he was her husband. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Albert oh, was yeah. Her husband. Okay, yeah, yeah. And Albert was very. Yeah, but that's. Pure that, so, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're very culturally influenced by the United, King, the especially United then. Kingdom. Yeah. Especially then. So that Puritanism. Uh, Puritanism. How did that Victorian. ascetism? Is that the yes. word? Well, how does that? The how do, how does that uh, evolve? Or I mean, okay. you know the way these. Uh, you know now we're in the movement of wokeness or something yeah. like that. How did these things? How did that? They start? take off for some reason. Yeah. I mean, she obviously identified with this Puritanism as well. I mean, the joke <laughs> about Victorians is that they wouldn't deep, they'd cover the leg and table table legs. Right. <laughs> I mean, a woman couldn't be seen. Her ankles couldn't be seen. That's I mean, very funny. Isn't is it? is yeah. that why? Yeah. Uh, do you think it came out of that? Does T- yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, no, so oh yeah, yeah. Because fast, no, but I, I honestly, I get quite sexually excited by table legs. <laughs> <laughs> I love a fucking table leg. <laughs> Cover it up, you dirty <laughs> bastards! <laughs> um, but that's so interesting. No, but then but, let's Puritanism see, yeah. came from who? who, who it, but like, it came out of that evangelical movement, which is oh, that's what hardline you said Christian movement in where mainly Wales, but it, it, it Welsh. spread throughout England Same. and here, yeah, too. Uh, among the Protestants in it here, and and it was a it was a status symbol, like the it more the more uh, you know uh, sexually rigid, yeah, sexually mm. very narrow, mm. uh, and wouldn't tolerate any deviance beyond marriage, the sexuality beyond marriage. So the Puritanism, the the the, yeah. t- the buttoned up kind of thing, that's a sign of you know well to do ness. It was respectability, re- respectability. And the, this but, rising Catholic Church wanted yes. to impress society at large, wanted to out- outrespect Victorian England, if you like, in its mores, and that's. It believed by many people to be the reason why the Irish Catholic Church became so narrow on issues of sexuality in the latter part of the 19th century, which continued then into the 20th but, century. But it created a collective a collective psychosis that yes. you sort of carried with you yeah. and that made you awkward about your body, awkward yeah. about being horny, awkward about being with a woman and having yeah. desire for the woman yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Do you, think, the, it's, the, the do you think it's something to do with culture as well? Like there was that, an economic you know, basis for it too. Yeah. After, and, after the famine. I mean, before the famine... We were pretty sexually active people. It, population we were right, <laughs> right, left, and right, no. left, and centre. No, but can, can I just ask you? Uh, um, eight eight pa- million pa- people. We've never had eight million people here since this. Pa- yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's go back yeah. to that. Let's go. Let's let's all uh, go calm back down. to that. <laughs> let's all calm down. Cover the legs of the table. Yeah. Um, so we weren't like that then, collectively as a country. We weren't sexually squeamish or awkward. Or I know things are, have changed a lot now. Thankfully, I think mm-hmm. uh, the uh, young people are very happy fiddling around oh, with themselves. She can't yeah. get them out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> no. So what was it like back then? And what? what so you said like the, the the Catholic Church didn't really take off till eighteen twenty mm-hmm. kind of thing, or fifties, sixties, seventies that period. Yeah. So Most so days. before that. You know, what was like, you know, what do we know what it was like, how we were sexually before that? We are well, before that we were what we are becoming. So interesting. Very uh, relaxed around issues of sexuality. Religious practice rare because there were no priests or they were difficult to get. But the people did above all things. The people wanted to baptize their children and they wanted a priest for funerals. And that's where we're going back to again. Yeah. Mm. But um then, I mean, with Victorian respectability and this new church, very rigid, very strictly controlled church. I mean, Paul Cullen wanted uh, Ireland to be answerable only to Rome. Uh, the priests were very, very strict in terms of the way they ran parishes, etc. And uh, and this element of sexuality. But I did refer to the fact that there was an economic base for all of this, too. A very promiscuous people, as we were normal people as we were before the famine, were sustained by the potato. A, a crop that grew plentifully in small areas of ground. So there was uh, when a, a 
young family came along, new new family, they get the land. The, the original family's land would be subdivided for the new couple, and subdivision was widespread throughout Ireland. But be, because of that, the potato failed, that was got rid of. They moved. People moved. Land was cleared by landlords. They brought in, started rearing cattle or, or going into tillage. Uh, in from then on, only one son would inherit the farm from the father. Uh, and the other children either had to emigrate or some of them, many of them, joined religion. And so there was nothing for most of them. So that's why you had this proliferation. First of all, and the guy who did, and it was the guy who did inherit, uh, couldn't marry till the old pair died because he didn't actually own the property and you couldn't bring in a woman. So fertility rates plummeted. You had this proliferation of spinsters and bachelors. Uh, and our, which which lives on or not did, as much now, but lived but on into my time. I remember yeah. it. I the, mean, bachelor up, farmer, the bachelor farmer. Yeah. The bachelor farmer. There were there were often more bachelors and spinsters in a community than there were married couples. And uh, what those uh, farmers they look into animals. You got what? You <laughs> you know, this perversion. Is, is this the Polish angle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, but that's true. But, 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 you, but you know, yeah, yeah, but you yeah. know what you were saying uh, with the boys being handy. You know, you're out in yeah. Connemara, yeah. and you know, you ah, see. Stop <laughs> it. The farm is but any, anyway, um, <laughs> you see they refer to people irreverently from my county as sheep shaggers. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> we take grave exception to that. It's woolly thinking. <laughs> well, but doesn't celibacy in the church creates perversion in itself? Well, Hannah, they would forcefully deny that. And indeed, it was also argued that celibacy was one of the reasons why you had so much child abuse involving Catholic priests. And of course, they say mm. that's not case. the case. There's been study after study after study to prove this. Well, maybe. But it would make sense. And, and st- celibacy is only in existence for half of Christianity. Mm. It didn't, mandatory celibacy, in other words, the obligation that priests take the vow, didn't exist for uh, up the first thousand years of Christianity. Yeah, it's if you ever look at funny, the uh, look at the popes, the the yeah. previous popes like the, uh, the Borgia, Alexander the Second, the American uh, kids, and, and they were and they were after the rule was introduced. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> in the fifteen and sixteen hundreds. But it's so interesting, like um, you know, we are now living in the most f- present. We're in the present moment of humanity right now in this moment, and we look back, you know, and we think, God, we've evolved so much, and we we know so much more. But in a way. In certain regards, they kind of knew more back then because they knew less. They had just a much more, uh, in certain regards, they had a a very relaxed human approach to relationships. And Mm. I'd just love to know, I'd love to know what it was like in 1732. Like how how did, I guess there were pubs and and dances and people would meet up that way. And and, uh, it it, it, it wasn't, uh, but, but... But if you were a peasant, you were just Pe- stuck stuck to the ground digging potatoes and you had no life, truly. It was, well, it was mean, miserable. Uh, I don't think that peasant and could you'd afford be even go wor- and Working drink. about 16 hours a day every yeah, day. You were, yeah, you were property of, of the landlord or of the guy who owns the well, land. Well, let's say, let's say it, it seemed like this, uh, this, when the famine happened, the way our countryside was set up, it was just, it had such a devastating uh, effect. I wonder wh- ha- what Ireland would have been like if there was no famine. Um, I, I, w- do you think how sustainable that lifestyle could I have? don't, I mean... Yeah, it's hard to... Yeah, well, uh, we were hugely dependent upon one crop. Yeah. It was inevitable something was going... I mean, and famines didn't stop with the 18, in 1850. Mm. There were famines continuing through the 19th century. There were severe famines in the west of Ireland in the 1870s. Mm. Uh, but when people are totally dependent to that degree on a single crop, you, it's it's a recipe or for, uh, for, disaster. for it's just an accident. Yeah. To, I wonder, did they, were they well aware of that before it happened? Uh, did they think you know this potentially? There had been famines before that on oh, a small scale, right? Um, but they were just wedded into this. Yeah, you know, I mean, life was not. I mean, was no a picnic. Pardon yeah. the pun back in those times. Mm-hmm. I mean, it has been said that life in those days, generally speaking, not only in Ireland, was short, nasty and brutish. Yeah. Ignorance, no education, look at toil, sweat and tears. And a lot of violence into a families. Violence, like yeah. recently, because, you know, I'm talking about Poland and we talking about 1920s, 30s and, you know, you're all thinking roaring 20s. And but there's just minority of people. And there was the fi- film came out about peasants in Poland. So the women who were in the countryside, 
they actually were owned by the family, by the father, a lot of times sold to another man, yeah. like arranged marriage for money, like you would have it in India or, you know, like we you would say, and we had it here yeah. or sold yeah. as slaves to yeah. work in somebody's yeah. earth's field. They had they, what did they call it? Indentured say. servitude or something. Yeah, yeah that's, and, that's and some of them managed to escape to the city or just to, they would work as hard, but at least they weren't, a, uh, you know, um, a, you know, they weren't, they, they were more in charge of their own independence. Independence, yeah. 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 So it was horrific life. It horrific, was. you well, know. That was, that was normal. That was seen mm. as normal by them too. I mean, life was tough, very, very tough, especially for women. Yeah, it was, it was, it was tough. Like, I mean, it was miserable. It was just yeah. like, how would you even want to live and yeah. work yeah. all day long? Yeah, you, ma field? you imagine the conversations that like people were having at that time, like, uh, oh, yeah, my, my, my daddy sold me off to uh, that guy. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I heard he's OK, you know, and that that would be like the, the line you were going for where, you know, you see now it's like, Oh yeah, I don't don't like the way his eyebrows look. You know, <laughs> and then you're uneducated, and then you have no idea what your rights are, and you got the church rights didn't come into it. Yeah, so you know, like um, in fact, the church they turned turned turn to the church as far as there was any church at the time for mm. consolation or refuge, of whereupon the priest more or less said offered up to God. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, like wherever you go, church is so powerful like financially it's got power is even in poland during communist time wherever they you know people um, had the refuge in the churches churches were always owned by priests yeah. or, you know they owned the land the building the priest had a car yeah. the priest <laughs> had a stereo no one else had it the priest he lived on his own, his big house. Is this in, is this in uh, Elvlong? In, in, in a communist Poland, everywhere. Hannah came from a town called Elvlong. Yeah. yeah but yeah, I guess it, it, at that time, John Paul, because he became uh, the Pope, yeah. John Paul II. Yeah. And, and the fact that he was sort of a power outside of communism made him somebody to... Yeah, and it was but also even, that but the even co before, communist regime. church was respected in communist Poland. Yeah. Maybe because he had money yeah. and had controlled people because even and identified with the country mm. with, with I mean a bit the same here before we got independence the church was if you like the focus for Irish identity mm. and I think it was the same with Poland they were the leaders of the people in many ways yeah yeah it was they just the opposition to communism yes and they were I mean our priest now played a different game a very clever political game mm. but um, for instance Cardinal Connell was Connell Sorry, Cullen, Cullen was a very, uh, very much an Irish nationalist, but he was very opposed to Irish revolutionaries, the Fenians in particular. He violence, in other words, he was totally opposed to, to physical violence because he was in Rome when uh, the Italians took over the city and ran the Pope, which they did for about two years um, in the eighteen forty eight, whatever or thereabouts. But our our history is so much a parallel of yours, except we're a little, excuse me, a little bit ahead. Uh, for historic reasons. I mean, the po mm. communism remained until 1989, at least in Poland or thereafter. We got our independence in 1922. And I mean, and the history of the church in both countries is similar. Very close to the native people, identified with the people. Um, the church itself went through a, a period of persecution. It overcame the persecution. It had then its triumphal phase, if you like. It became mm. dominant or whatever completely. And I know in Poland today, as has happened here, is now it's in its decay stage. Yeah, but it's uh, because it's of similar reasons. True, but yeah. it's n n not even closer to people still go to church. Yeah, yeah, or more so than in Ireland. Yeah, because I think because church was separate from the state, the state so church never ran the schools. Yeah. Church never ran hospitals. There were never crosses in the school or the hospitals, so it hasn't had that grip on okay. the people themselves. Were there a lot, lots of stuff about uh, uh, child sex abuse in uh, Poland? There are some and coming but not more as, and not more. As mu much. Not as much not and just, not, yeah. not as systemic as in Ireland because they just purely didn't run schools. There I were mean, only you, Sunday I, I, if schools. You, if you could, yeah. And a lot of time there were priests having affairs uh, with women. Yeah. 
which is actually better because there were consensus yeah. and there were children yeah. born. But it's, it's extraordinary that uh, in a way that the church actually still exists, uh, because you think to yourself, like th these people that were held up in such reverence in the community and, and for, for these for these people. Uh, uh, you know, to do what they did. It, it was such a shock, I think, to so many people at the time. But how has it affected uh, the Catholic Church? I mean, do you think uh, the, the Catholic Church will survive? Is it? Is it a... I mean, the Catholic Church today uh, is nothing like it was in Ireland. In Ireland? Yeah. But in other parts of the um, world? Um, I, I, I mean, do believe that, I mean, the Church has adjusted and is adjusting now as well to this new situation. Their personnel are changing their disposition towards the people. They're becoming, to use France, Pope Francis' phrase, they smell of the people. They're getting down there with the people. Um, I do believe myself that in Ireland it would be in a far worse state but for the ordinary priest on the ground. The people identify with the priest on the ground or in the parish. The people have also separated out their belief or faith from the institution. Right. Uh, especially leadership. The people are cynical about church leadership as they are about leadership generally. Um, so that's how they sustain their own belief. Or, I mean, and that's why I think it'll survive. And I speak as an agnostic. I, I don't practice and haven't mm. for all my adult, adult life. But I do believe the Catholic Church will continue in Ireland because people need to believe. Do you, well, do you think it's, oh, sorry, uh, Jack, do you, do you think it's uh, beneficial for people to believe in religion in like a like a maybe not an individualistic sense but more of like a societal sense do you think do you think that religion has uh serves a key purpose or do you think it's you know do you think it's important or if it wasn't there there'd be something in place of it it's baked you know, like, into our dna though um, communities and the wise person like i mean yeah. and that's what yeah. kind of we i thought that pr the priest yeah. was and so i do feel we've missed out because of, because yeah. of that sorry i think the community aspect is very important yeah i mean marx described and, and, and milestones in people's lives 100 uh, you know and, and, them. yeah initiation what? like in pagan Baptism, yeah because i think we as human we need faith yeah we need to believe in something bigger than us and paganism they they but believe they in sun yeah, yeah, in yeah. and they yeah, were right trees, it's, it's and, yeah. good to believe in the sun because it yeah. does well, i'm sure i'm sure yeah. there was a uh, druid abuses back in the in the uh, human um, nature the suns and stars well, well, and, yeah. well uh, i hope it's not human to nature to come back to jack's original question i mean uh, it was marx who described religion as the opium of the people in other words it was about delusion i don't think i think that's a facile statement marx wasn't right about everything yeah uh, i think it serves a great need people need to believe in things and mm. i mean insofar i uh, i would never i i would never challenge a person's faith mm. i think it's hugely important for people the structure I mean to their lives. The only people of faith that I will challenge are those who insist that I must believe what they believe. Um, but but, but what, what, what I mean is in, in, in uh, the continent of Africa and all the countries there is uh, the Catholic Church on the rise. Is it on the rise in South America or Absolutely. not? Absolutely. Oh, it is. It is. I mean, the fastest growing Catholic Church at the moment is African. OK. And it's also very conservative, old school church. For instance, Pope Francis introduced this blessing for same sex couples there at the end of last year. The Africans to a man, pardon the word, but it yeah. implies, said, no, we're not going to implement them. They will not. It will not happen in the African church. And yet a lot of priests are gay, aren't they? Well, they and would they, deny that. Yeah. <laughs> you will not. I mean, uh, there are uh, you, uh, certainly in Africa, you won't see an openly gay priest. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah. it's I mean, it's acknowledged. I mean, Mary McAleese, of all people, who wrote about this. In, who you wrote a book about. I wrote her biography, mm. her official biography. Who Hannah drove uh, yeah, th for I, two weeks. Yeah, Because uh, Hannah's did. a makeup artist and she was looking okay. after Mary McAleese. Oh, really? Yeah, so okay. I did her makeup and I drove yeah. her around. So okay. I was her chauffeur. And Hannah, I, Hannah was very impressed by Mary. Yeah, she's a fine, fine yeah. person. But in, before she went for the presidency in early 1997, she wrote an article for The Tablet, which is a UK uh, weekly Catholic magazine pointing out this very fact that at least half of Irish priests at that time, 27, mm. six years ago, were gay. And yet a very anti-gay. I yet mean, the, 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 I the, mean the institution that they were Especially in. Especially yes. then, yeah. under Ratzinger and John <clears throat> Paul, it was very anti-gay. Ratzinger came out, who became Benedict XVI in 1986. He was in Hitler Youth. He was. Now, to be fair, he had no choice. He was 16. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, ah, Jesus. I know. Yeah. <laughs> ah, no, no, no. <laughs> but he, um, in 86, came out with this extraordinary document uh, describing, and I'll get the phraseology right, saying how um, gays or homo homosexuals are objectionably disordered with a tendency to evil. I mean, moral mm. evil. Isn't that shocking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and they've spent, I mean, there's a, when he was Pope himself, uh, some Italian group brought out this book and uh, it, the cover, cover cover was pink and they, 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 um, the the title was The Pope is Small in, in OT Gay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So big mm -hmm. lettering, Pope is not, because there's a rumour that he himself may have been. Well, well I mean, practice. usually like, people... How would he know it's that a, he's a, gay? But, oh, no. No, but because people who are because so... Because they shouldn't have sex. Homophobia... Mm -hmm. Is I think is not necessarily about being afraid of other homosexual people. Yeah. It's a, afraid of the potential in yourself. yourself yeah. And so if you're yeah. so outspoken and and you know, you're obviously it, it, to me that shows fear, which reveals yeah. what are you fearful of? You're fearful of something that's yeah. in yourself. It's, it, it was the um, classic so, thing uh, in school. You know, I mean, you know, I think the we guys could, who, we we could all say in school like it's it, it wasn't a good thing, but you should all call each other gay. Yeah, you weren't being homophobic necessarily, but you were just well without knowing it, you were. Yeah, well without knowing, it, but you were calling to the your, term your, of abuse. But, you yeah. know, there was some kids that would get more annoyed at it. Like, they would call other people gay, but if you call them gay, they would get more annoyed at it yeah. Yeah. than yeah, other yeah, people yeah. would. And that was always kind of... <laughs> but the reason, but, 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 the reason but, they picked on Benedict saying he maybe was because when he became Pope, he really got into all this finery stuff. Right. I mean, well, really well, it's a very, it's a very well the expensive vestments and all. But that Patsy, stuff. I mean, it's a very camp. It was. Uh, he the was very Latin camp. mass. Yeah. The whole thing, the vestments, yeah. the dresses, yeah. and the yeah. this and the that. But what's interesting, you know, because we're so uh, I inward looking. What's the nepot? No, no, no. We're we're sort of we're very concerned with ourselves in Ireland, and we think that somehow the Catholic Church. This is. No, the Catholic Church is a worldwide global institution. Yeah. And uh, so so the fact that it's only a small little thing that ha I mean, in We're terms tiny. of the, in terms of the length of the how long yeah. it's been in existence, yeah. Yeah. how long it will be in existence. So but I, I guess if if things like that don't topple the Catholic Church, nothing uh, yeah. will. But like, I, again, people can say, well, it's not because of the belief. It's not because of the in, uh, the institutions, because of the individuals but surely you know one is driven by the other you know the the belief and and the way they live or are or, or the, the set of beliefs that they're told to live by sort of uh brings out this uh you know sort of well what, what i'm trying to say is uh catholicism it seems to want to distance itself or is slightly disgusted by humanity a little bit. That's 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 the way I feel about it. The it form wants to that we've known. The form that we've known. I don't think that's necessarily the feature of the yeah. church in the Latin countries. Uh, OK, they're mu they're much. Yeah, much more relaxed around the issue of sexuality. Okay. Uh, and, and priests have been having relationships there and people mm. turn a blind eye. Yeah. But uh, in our Anglo mm. Saxon world, yeah, it is. And I, and I, and I include in that Canada, North America, Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, out of the same culture, mm. but quite different attitude to sexuality. Had mm. been. But, um, but I, it, oh, so, so, so they're, they're, they're more in tune, do you think, with, with uh, humanity and desire and what we actually are, as opposed to, it's almost like the body, uh, you know, it's, it's evil or something, yeah, well, you know, and you want to try and distance yourself from, yeah. from, you know, base but urges. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're looking for the correlations or whatever, or like if, if so, it's obviously not the religion necessarily that is uh, that is causing people to be kind of repressed, not just the religion. It can't be if there's if, if so many other co countries are Catholic, it must not be just the religion. If if our own the same people like us are in America, just different generations apart and they're more open it, it must be something to do with our culture our well well okay the, the smallness can, 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 of the yeah. smallness of our country oh, okay can i just the also say to each other I, ha I haven't been to mass i haven't been to mass in a long time and i was there recently uh, i was at a funeral and um you know as a comedian uh, you have to try and write new material all the time uh you know to have a sustainable um relationship with your fans mm. and then i was sitting in the mass and the same stuff again and again and this part of the mass we do this and then we do this and then this happens and, and it's it's the same it's, it's the same thing and it's been like that for god knows how long yeah. and, and it, you know i mean well, it's, it's it's a very unimaginative way of approaching it i mean if you if you really did believe what you're saying you'd be a, a bit more animated or you'd come up with different ways of 
it's, it's very formalized and it's it's, it's uh, literature which is formalized and people like that sort of predictability oh maybe except okay. that in mass if you're a believer you, i mean it's an extraordinary thing to think what happens at the eucharist that god comes down into that ceremony and transforms bread and wine into his body and blood yeah. Okay. I mean, Je I mean, if sorry, you're a believer. Sorry. Well, no, no, no. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. But, yeah, but, but, but David, if you if you can't if you can't understand like no, no, for, but, for no, a it's certain very people, insulting. That's, that's it's, it's very so insulting special. to say to people that they can't get their heads around. Well, it's a mystery. Well, that's not good, good enough. God comes down from where? I mean, go, go, well, you know, you know, they, they have that sort of pious. <laughs> It's beyond. A, well, no, that, I don't. Well, I don't like that. I mean, mystery it, you know. isn't peculiar to religion. It's also a feature of science. But what's wrong with? Well, how do we know where the? We don't know where this being, this existence came from. And science has changed all the time. Yeah, all the time. Know, so. So, well, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't. Science well, well, accepts co accept consciousness yeah. now. Yeah, but but mystery meaning we don't know. What they're saying is they do know, but they believe in it, but they don't. But no, they can't how? explain it. What? They don't know how. Yeah, but but they, but, but, they, but by I mean, the way, back, sticking with the Eucharist, which speaking, is the central thing for Christians. Yeah, yeah speaking Christians. about paganism, yeah. that's lifted from uh, old, you know, Celtic pagan. Uh, even pagan gives a negative connotation, but where you're eating the 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 body of your dead ancestors and all that sort of stuff, isn't it? I mean, that's lifted out of. I mean, that's not specific to Catholicism. The idea of eating. And drinking blood, eating flesh. No, and drinking it wouldn't blood. be. I mean, I'm, uh, what, what, what is it about? Why are we? Human, why human do we get? But what, yeah, but why do we get all misty-eyed about the idea of the transubstantiation? This word that uh, we're all saying—it's like, it's like it's no, but it's like look, you know, ooh, transubstantiation. Okay, you know, you know what I mean. When you think what are we doing? We're, huh, huh? I mean, I am thinking about it. The difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. Oh has Jesus! Split Christianity in transubstantiation, which is the Catholic belief. They believe that uh, the bread and wine is literally transformed into the body and blood of. In the oh, Jesus, Anglican yeah. tradition, for instance, they believe the bread and wine is transformed into the body and blood of, but it retains the properties of bread and wine. And, and it, but it, it's extraordinary, Patsy. Like, here we are. Yeah. They're for wars of these issues. Do you know, Jack, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. yeah. So they're all sitting around. A, I don't think that's a big problem. The like, 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 so, like, no, but they're all sitting yeah. around a table going, hang on a second. No, no one discusses There's no that. qualities of bread. That is Jesus and it's sacrosanct and it's sacred. And the Protestants are going, look, it's, you can, it's bread. Like, you know, it's clearly bread. It's not. No. Yeah. I, it's, that it's, it's, is it's, one of the major obstacles to Christian unity. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, I'm a Protestant. <laughs> yeah, you just want to be English. <laughs> that's that's the real thing. <laughs> but but what, what? I mean, where does that come from? Where did that idea come from? Theology, it, he, 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 did, 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 a Reformation. Did Jesus say that? He said, "This is my body. This is my blood." Then so down to interpretation, as so many things. Who he are. said in the, in the, at the Last Supper, "This is my body. This is my blood." This is my body. This is my blood. Yeah. So in other words, well, this is, is a so, metaphor. Yeah, but he would no, but he was also saying. Look, um, you know, I, I, I'm, it's 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 kind of like real codependence. It's like I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm fucked. I'm gonna die and all the rest of it. But he didn't you die. Can, okay, but the you can after. you can live on. You can mm. live. I will live with you. I'll never leave you. Yeah, he, he has the biggest memory fear of me. <laughs> he has the, the biggest next... fear of missing out in the and, whole. And I want you to. <laughs> but but already, you see, this That's, is what this, this is what I mean. Mystery is always a great you you not you unique selling point. Yeah. What about what is the fact that um, you know me and Hannah met and you know we had penetrative sex and I <laughs> fertilized eggs and hannah got pregnant and were too like that's incredible it's amazing it, like life itself yes. is is so brilliant and to me it is enough well that's there's a theological question there do we live in free will or is everything predestined Destined. and that's a religious question a theological philosophical question and you can kind of go around in circles Absolutely. with that Till to death. Oh, who's the famous English journalist? Uh, he was always going on about it. Um, there's two brothers, Hitchens. Hitchens, yeah, yeah. Christopher yeah, Hitchens. He was right. going on. About he was an atheist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever meet Christopher Hitchens? No. 
Would yeah. you like to have? Absolutely. Um, yeah. He was a militant atheist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, aggressively atheist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's fair enough. Fantastically entertaining. You, you uh, would love him. Yeah, you love guy. him, David, for oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Great guy. I mean, very articulate and, and uh, very entert- entertaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Did, you, uh, did you have notions about joining the priesthood? As a youngster, yes. Yeah. I was very religious. Hmm. So I know what faith is. I know Where it did is. it all go wrong? <laughs> I thought too much. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think if you do, if you do think about yeah. things, it's very, um, there's a lot of, you know, big, big questions yeah. that you're supposed to brush to one side yeah. Yeah. that can't be answered. No, I lost mm. very early on and it was with great reluctance because it meant an awful lot to me. Mm. It, had, it had a huge, meaningful dimension to my life. And then suddenly and gradually it disappeared. I mean, it is a beautiful thing and to think. how come? To what th- trigger that it disappeared? There wasn't a trigger. I just began to think about things. I mean, I was okay. always a thinking kid in these areas because I took mm-hmm. it very seriously as a youngster. Uh, I suppose when thinking of priesthood, the first thing that put me off was I realized I could never take a vow of obedience. Mm-hmm. And I could see the consequences of, of that among the priests that I were teaching me or whatever. I mean, most of them were teaching. They didn't have a vocation to teach. Their vocation was to be pastor in a parish. This is a minor example. And um, and then it went on from there to uh, uh, questioning the divinity of Jesus Christ. And then the issue of divinity itself. Mm. And I couldn't get any satisfactory answers to any of them and learned to live with ignorance. And and it is a beautiful thing, really, because I know people who feel they have a relationship with God. But but it's a lovely thing to think of a, a a big figure who's just looking out for you and wants you to do well and, uh, and uh, you know, a, a father figure. Who's but positive. Who's I, can I just say that I think that scriptures are very different from institution of Catholic yeah. Church. Yeah. So I wouldn't dismiss scriptures. Yeah. The collective you know, wisdom of the you ages. You know, I think it's... That's a very good phrase. That's a, I mean, that's what religion has, is collective wisdom. Mm. I wouldn't discard it. No. Mm. Yeah, and there is, and you can inter, and the Catholic Church interpreted for their own benefit, and that's the. Are you a believer, Hannah? Um, um, I was born as a, you know, um, Catholic uh, member, and I was baptized, go all this, and uh, then I completely rejected uh, it. It's a yes or no answer now. No, because there's no yes or no. Well, but I, I, I am a th- believer, but I'm yeah. not a member of a Catholic church. Okay. I don't like the institution. But I, I think do women, think, women, women oh, have can a... Can I just say, finish? Yeah. But I do think that having a faith just gives you that peace, you know? And I was funny recently, so um, I was a Buddhist for, for a time, <laughs> and then I stopped being a Buddhist, and then I turned into Hindu, and, and then I realized that you can't just take on somebody else's religion yeah. because it's not in your blood, it's not in your custom, you know, if you're a Buddhist. You can't just... Um, reject all the possessions because you live in a Western world and you can't let them go. You're not living in the mountains and you you don't have anything and you don't need to maybe do it. You don't have time to a retreat for a month and, you know, meditate. It, it doesn't work. So I was thinking going back. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I was uh, entertaining to become a Pentecostal <laughs> church member <laughs> because I've met few tongues. of them. Yeah. And... The power they had, you know, that sort of believe what they. But then I look into it and I said, "Oh my God, that's another, <laughs> another institution yeah. that it's actually very deviant, yes. yeah. because they have all these um, uh, profits, yeah. and they really thrive on people, um, you know, desire to be cured, to be, you know, uh, enlightened." You know, and they are profiteering of people. Yes. So, yeah. the, the, can I ask a question off the back of that? Um, because we're we're seeing as uh, societies get more and more modern, they kind of reject religion more and more. But uh, as we were saying, like there is a kind of social decay in society nowadays, and the like. If the big cities, people don't feel part of a community. So, do you think religion will get a kind of a, a resurgence? A resurgence. Because I don't think it, I no. don't think it'll ever go away, Jack. I think <laughs> yeah. I, seriously, I think it's I, I think it's. Whether but do you think it'll get as popular as before, as people kind of get more disillusioned, like with with, like if you look at social media, people are awful to each other. 
all this kind of thing, you know. I mean, what's happening in social media, I often think, again, coming back to the idea of collective wisdom, uh, you had the Eighth Commandment <laughs> presented by Moses, which is about uh, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit calumny, thou shalt not, in other words, defame or damage people. I mean, that was Moses whenever... How many millenniums was that? Mm. So what's happening in social media today is not new. Mm. It was regulated yeah. in laws by the past, and it will be regulated again. It's just a very, very slow about it. But I, I mean, one of the great questions is one of the great miseries is: Did man invent God, or did God in, uh, invent man, a great man? And I don't think we'll have an answer to that question. What, what is extraordinary, though, is like the the uh, you know the incredible just being. Like we don't, we didn't create ourselves. I, I, I didn't create my hands or my body or whatever. I, I, I exist. I, I didn't uh, do anything for what this is, and and that's incredible. And I think if you can live well and 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 you know exercise and not uh, uh, be negative. I mean, abuse your body, like in terms of drinking or smoke. And well, I smoke whatever, but I mean, I think that's a form. Uh, a very quiet form of uh, worship, if you'd yes. like. Um, so, and I also think that uh, the fa the fact that we do exist, I mean, it's it's I mean, it, it's miraculous. Yeah. It seems to be there's no other uh, there's no other life in the universe that we could, that we know of. So, I, I would say, like um, like, what more do we need? I, I suppose because it's we we want because it's it's the big gaping unanswered question but what's it all can, can for I, can how are we here but what it's what, a what, mystery what, of life can I, I can i say why i think yeah. religion is around okay. and everything i actually think it's a biological development in people i think when humans were developing and becoming huge bigger hierarchies you know you started out as like you know you see chimpanzees they got like 60 people in their thing so it's it's easier to well as rich hall said it, you know if, if you believe in evolution how come monkeys are still monkeys <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 but but you know that uh, everyone's it was just 60 but as uh, people started to become bigger communities and everything i think uh, religion came as a as a way of of keeping these hierarchies intact yeah it's a bit of a racket i think that that yeah but i think it was kind of like a biological development where humans need hierarchies like unfortunately so like, it's an evolution from that natural yeah thing. like can, in can order I, can, to foster that you know? can i just ask we, I just, if, the final word um yeah meaning of life please <laughs> <laughs> i mean sorry no okay to come back that. to just one, one point i want to make about the catholic church which is the point that mary mcaleese frequently makes because she's very much a critic of the church, uh, as it is, while being a loyal Catholic herself, of particularly to, to do with the treatment of women and children, she has pointed out something: the Catholic Church is the biggest NGO in the world. Mm. That's a hell of an achievement. Mm. I mean, it does an awful lot of good. Mm. And I mean, we're very familiar with the bad here because of what's come out in recent years, not least to the work of people like myself. But that's a huge compliment to any institution. Yeah, it's a shame that they have to be in existence for. It's a shame that other that other people aren't doing. You know, Those stepping things. in, stepping into their. I I know, yeah, but it it, it it's just I like, why why are they at that? Like, you know. Can I ask? Sorry, uh, sorry. Patsy, one more question. I know it uh, is. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, go on. Uh, so, you know, so we're talking all, all about Christianity and the the kind of different places it's getting more popular, dipping in the Western world, but one religion, Islam, which is get is is getting more and more and more popular. What's your view on that? Like in, in Ireland, we're getting more people. Like, do you think the religious landscape of Ireland is going to turn? Well, I mean, that's a ridiculous question a bit. But what's your view on Islam? Do you think they're going to have the same thing as Christianity where certain abuses get or called Jesus out? Christ. Or I, I don't think abuse is peculiar to any religion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a feature of all religions, mm. as is persecution, as is execution. Uh, Islam is still in single figures in Ireland. It mm. is growing uh, it's a, a rather we have a rather unusual form of it in Ireland compared to other countries in that most of our Muslims are uh, recent arrivals mm. and are professional people yeah, in yeah. the middle class. Um, they're moderate people. Mm. We don't have any extremes so here here so far anyhow compared to other parts of the world. Mm. Um, but I mean, religion serves a purpose, and uh, I mean, uh, I, I I thought Anna's point Hannah's point there about um, if you like returning to your own tradition rather than having explored all the other ones is very real it's mm. it's what you're most familiar with it's our way of looking at the world and as as it has been for generations among our ancestors etc so it's probably truer 
for us to do that. But I do believe religion will survive and will continue. Um, we're, in, the, in the Western world, it's going through a bad patch, to say the least about yeah, it. Yeah. The Western world is the most secular in the, in the world now. But that's rare. I mean, in every other continent, you have huge, strong movements of religion. Africa, mm. particularly in Africa, you've got two very strong movements, Christianity and Islam. Uh, side by side, particularly in Nigeria, which is almost equally split between the two, often f for worse rather than for better. Um, in South America, Christianity in all its forms, evangelical Christianity in particular, is very strong. America is, in religion as in political terms, completely divided down the middle between very hardline Christians and more moderate or more liberal ones. Uh, Europe is a bit of an outlier at the moment in mm. that it's very secular and religion is in decline dramatically in Europe. But I don't think it's going to die either in Europe. So maybe like like me and people who live in Europe, we think that oh, religion's on the way down, but it's that's not the case at all. It's just because we're the outlier. I think that you've come ar around at a particular point yeah, yeah. in the pattern, if you like, uh, uh, and the yeah, cycle yeah, yeah. in Ireland, mm. especially, or indeed in Europe in general, mm. where religion um, has taken a big, big dip. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't think it'll go away. But globally, it's probably it's as strong as yeah, ever. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, let's not look at let's look at the, the the concerted attempts by humanity to get rid of it in communist. Eastern Europe, yes, right. In yeah. China, right. Yeah. Um, it it's hasn't just, succeeded. No. Look at look at India today. It's back. It is the driving force Hinduism mm. behind mm. Modi. Modi, I mean, and that's an aggressive form of, of Hinduism, which is very unusual for a gentle religion. <laughs> but uh, that is sad. And, and can I also just say, you know, I've travelled a lot when I was younger. I lived in Japan. I lived in Australia, and 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 I love people. And the nicest people I ever met were from Iraq, from Iran, yeah. from Israel, yeah. from India. Yeah. Uh, you know, ninety nine percent of people couldn't be nicer, very friendly, very yeah. hospitable. And I'm very grateful for that. And, you We're know, just having conversations. No, no, I know. But there's a, there's a sort of a slightly um, fractious uh, association with but you talking know, you, about we, certain things. Is it no? When no. you talk to religious people, though, like one of our favorite places <clears throat> to go to, one, my favorite place in London is Speaker's Corner. Oh, yes. And the whole time it's about Christianity and, and Muslim and, and Ju Judaism. But when you talk to uh, true believers, They'll talk to you about anything faith wise and they won't get offended. Like if you are open to them to talk yes. to them about and their faith. Listening. And it is beautiful, actually. They, they it's will, very advanced democracy, it, you know? I think. But as well. by the very nature of things, Jack, at big speaker's corner, you're going to get the hard end. The hard end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, what do you what do you think? Um, you, are you content now? Uh, Personally, Patsy? Yeah. I am pretty content yeah. in my lot. I don't think there is a hereafter it doesn't matter to me yeah i think i'm part of an evolutionary process uh, of one of consciousness as well as material um i think this existence is incredible it's fascinating it is it's beyond explanation it's beyond understanding it is if i might use the word a mystery um, well it is I'm a mystery happy with that yeah uh, uh, and do you think we don't handle death we we just sort of we we kind of hand it over to people when we how do you do you think we should handle death better i think we handle death very well here do we in ireland and uh, we don't hide it away yeah i mean uh, i was at a funeral recently a very very tragic funeral and the whole community turned last week whole community turned out to celebrate the life of these two people and to support literally mm. and emotionally the family left behind mm. I think we do death very well. I think that's one thing where we could, we have lessons to teach a lot of the secular or secular European neighbours is mm -hmm. to take accept death as part of life, and that's part of our culture that goes beyond. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, it goes back to our peasant culture. Wakes. Yes. Which were outlawed, by the way, by Cardinal Cullen and company. They took the wake out of the home. They took the funeral out of the home and moved it into the church, the building. Right. Which was uh, what he did with all the other religious practices before. And I don't like that when a priest who yeah. did, has no relationship with the person who's dead is just reading off. And uh, Patsy liked to turn on light bulbs in his kitchen or whatever. So that's interesting. Yeah. So the, the wake and, and just uh, the wake meaning to wake, wake the. Awake mm. as opposed to woke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awake was where uh, the body was laid out in the kitchen usually of the house and the neighbours came in and they talked about the person and they drank and they smoked 
and there were even pipes, particular pipes, do jeans for the occasion, and they'd celebrate and they'd dance and they'd get drunk and whatever happened throughout the night. Mm. Mark the life of the passing of the. Uh, Patsy, it's such a pleasure talking to you, and I apologise for my own ignorance and inability to be articulate because I'm out of my depth. It's great to be sitting with you, and uh, it's thank you for. No one would here. ever accuse you of being in a <laughs> well, well, I'm not talking about verbose. I'm yeah. talking about not being able to crystallize my thoughts around uh, the Well, it's not my area of expertise, yeah. but I could literally uh, chat to you all day. Uh, did you want to say something, Jack? Do we do we want to do conspiracy corner or are we going to head off? Uh, I'm not sure. Jack, do you have a conspiracy corner? Well, I mean, it's quite ridiculous. So, I mean, it's, it's up to you whether you want to hear I, it or I don't, not. I don't, we hold for Nicolas Cage just quick because we've been here for quite a while. Go no, we, we can we can go on. We don't, well, what I mean, what is know. your conspiracy today? Just quickly, because it's ridiculous. So <laughs> go on. It's ridiculous, but it's... Um, I don't even want to say go it. Now. <laughs> well, yeah, you have to say it. We'll cut it out. So the, so the conspiracy is, is that... Um, you have to do your music. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I have to do. I have to do my music. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Apologies. Come on, Jack, get Apologies. with the program. Don't you want to graduate? Okay, go on. What's conspiracy <laughs> corner this week? Okay, so it's about. Um, go on. Uh, it's it's linked to the Garden of Eden. Oh Jesus! Uh, you know, just he wasn't topical. <laughs> he topical. <wasn't. laughs> okay, go on. And uh, so uh, there's the idea that there is um, uh, that aliens came to the Earth while humans were at their um, early stage. And they f- tunneled through into the <laughs> to the, the oh. earth into the earth's core, and that is where the Garden of Eden, not as we know it, is, and that's where all the kind of religions and and stuff like that came out from, and it was like given to humanity from this alien race. Yeah, uh, I bet I think Patsy <laughs> is, would back you on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, even the theory, I mean, in Christian belief, it is believed that Jesus uh, was, as other, I nearly said assumed, terrible mistake, he ascended into heaven. Mm. And some, some conspiracy theorists think he was taken away by aliens or whatever. <laughs> uh, no. And the Virgin Mary, another teaching, Catholic teaching, is that Mary assumed, was assumed into heaven. There's an interesting distinction there, by the way. Jesus ascended because he was God. So he went up under his own power. <laughs> she, she didn't have that power. Right. Somebody had to bring her up, so she was assumed. Yeah, yeah, assumed. yeah. yeah but they, by Holy Spirit. Yeah, was it no? Aliens. But, <laughs> but aliens, apparently, exactly. the Holy Spirit is that <laughs> Mary, uh, Mary survived and she had offsprings. Yeah. That the line of well, Jesus, Jesus, still Jesus actually survived. That's the and the uh, that well, I said that conspiracy here before actually, <laughs> but it was the uh, Merovingian. Dynasty yeah. in France. Well, I, def- I do def- definitely feel slightly godlike, so that's he, I'm definitely related to Jesus. He did have brothers and sisters. I'm actually that's Thank a mention you. of the Bible. You're really? right, you're welcome. Yeah, it's a mention wow. of the Bible. But how did he have brothers? And but sisters? what about scriptures? Yeah. So they had after Presum- Jesus, presumably. Yeah. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. They didn't have any hidden. <laughs> <laughs> you know what about scriptures like uh, red um, um, Red Sea Scrolls? You know yes. they were found yeah. out later. Yeah. And they were not uh, included in... So the, the, there were numerous Gospels. Mm. But in the earlier church, they decided on the four yeah. as being the valid Gospels. There's a Gospel of Peter, I think, as well. But there were quite a number of them. But they, they said the, the real Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. You see, oh. that's why we so oppressed. Because the church <laughs> decided that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just, uh, I can't, it, it, we have to call uh, yeah. it's just um, it's you're just fascinating uh daniel we'll talk we'll we'll hold we'll do um we'll do um open the cage t- next time yeah sure <laughs> um patsy mcgarry oh yeah do we have you got the music jack to, to go on well, just trust me <laughs> okay well he's your father we've, 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 never le- trusted. we've, le- we've learned a lot in this episode I could be related very remotely to Christ which is good to know and I've always felt that that's why you have the beard that's why you're and I forgive you um, <laughs> thank you Hannah thank you my princes my young princes Jack and Daniel someday this kingdom of dirt will be yours and uh, Patsy McGarry absolute pleasure and uh, hopefully we can talk I again do, soon thank you where's the fucking music Jack <laughs> well, you should be pumping that up while I'm doing that. Now he, pump- he can edit. It. He can edit. It. No, I can't. Can't he? So there we are, guys. <laughs> Thanks very much. Not at all. My pleasure. No, I was just saying that you know.